Hello and welcome to the State of the College 2021. Now it is hard to believe that it has been a year. At this time last year, we were just a month into the pandemic and some of us were picking up laptops to take home. Others were calling students who hadn't shown up in the virtual universe and the Shaw Center was distributing food. IT was giving out technology and public safety was taking on health duties. Most of us were still figuring out Zoom. We were coaching each other on those features that now seem pretty amateur, like sharing a screen or using the chat function. And our faculty were helping students and each other in the complexities of remote learning. Everyone was doing something with urgency and responsibility. Now I share this snapshot from those first few weeks because we've made some extraordinary progress since then. We've learned a lot about what we didn't realize we could do. And this summer, we will be offering classes for the fourth season in a structured remote status. We have a full contingent of faculty who are experienced at teaching remotely. And we have lab experiences that have been recreated in homes, a feat that many of us said was impossible. We have counselors and academic program advisors working seamlessly over Zoom with students another paradigm we could not have imagined. The college has hosted guest speakers, job fairs, and student clubs online. We've delivered official testimony, hosted public board meetings, and even held a virtual commencement last spring. In other words, we have adapted every corner of the college experience to our realities. Essentially, We've responded in ways that the community colleges were meant to serve, doing whatever was needed to support our communities through crises, to protect the most vulnerable, and to drive economic mobility. Now, as you know, I am an ardent protector of this mission we serve at Montgomery College. 75 years after the Truman Commission's work called for a system of community colleges, and what has been envisioned is significant. A college like ours that understands the needs of its community and drives opportunity and growth. How the college continues to accomplish this as we began living with COVID more permanently is the question we face now. And we must face it within a wider context of racial and economic justice along with health equity. The experience of this past year has created a transformative moment not just for our nation, but for our institution. We have dug deeper into equity and inclusion. We've learned more about our students' lives and their needs, and we've found new partners in social justice and philanthropy, and gained insights on workforce development. And we have learned a lot about pedagogy. Our faculty and staff has extended themselves to meet students' learning needs with tutoring, recorded classes, library chat box, webinars, and mentoring, all in a remote status. Now the transition forced most of us to grow our skill sets, some of which have created more efficiency. In some targeted ways, there is more uniform access to certain resources. Virtual tutoring and Blackboard use have skyrocketed. Most of us now appreciate that technology can enhance our connections with our students. These are developments that reinforce the foundation of our mission. These are not patches we've put on around the edges. These are fundamental shifts in culture and expectations, which have the potential to improve student achievement in real ways. And our students will need it as they face new obstacles to transfer and hiring that COVID has created. One aside on technology in our new world, when I get an email from one of our successful students about their Montgomery College experience, they rarely mention the technology that helped them, but they always mention the people who spend extra time on their needs. They usually mention someone by name a counselor or an academic program advisor who showed them the right path, someone in financial aid who helped them access funds, someone who tutored them, got them into an honors program, or helped them into an internship. It's the people that matter to our students. That's what keeps them coming back. 
to maximize the impact our people can have on the student experience, we rely on technology as an assistance, as a critical tool to our work. But for those critical components that students remember years later, it's the people. In fact, I've gotten so many notes from students about their experiences this year that captures this. The high standards we created for serving our students before COVID are being sustained during COVID. When we're in person, it's a bit easier to see that every interaction with a student leaves an imprint from registration to enrollment to assessment. It is a chance to let them know how much they matter. In the virtual world, it takes more imagination. To have that same positive effect, you have to exert yourself further. This is a new world. No one's job description says, quote, interact virtually with students for eight hours a day. That's something that we've all had to live with and lean into and adapt to, and we've done it remarkably well. In fact, we've exceeded what most of us thought was possible. But in the next chapter, that will be the expectation. It will be the baseline. Some online education providers have been doing this for years, and we are now sharing space with them. So sustaining these connections without Zoom burnout, which is very real, y'all, will be a, an important point for learning for all of us. Now I wanna give a quick shout out to our human resources and elite teams in the areas because they have done a lot of work in helping us navigate the stress and uncertainty of this year. It's not often that offices like HR, STEM, and Elite take on so much large-scale change and simultaneously attend to the mental health and the well-being of employees with the attention they did this year. I have been so impressed, and I want to say thank you so much. But I also know that they were driven by the same motives we all shared. Our work this year has been so fundamental to our mission that we just leaned in. We knew we had to support students. And in our next chapter, the college's work would be more than just mitigating the impacts of structural inequality though, because that won't be enough. Instead, we will have to design systems in which equity is integral. We will make decisions that are actively anti-racist. We will engage in thinking that is radically inclusive and processes that are equity building. As we reroute ourselves in the fundamental mission of the Truman Commission, we will do so with the new lenses on health and safety, racial justice and economic mobility that has been paramount to what we have done this year. The good news in this moment though, is that we have been better positioned to have greater impacts. The recovery funds that the college is poised to receive can strengthen our ability to fulfill our mission in several ways. Health and safety, access and inclusion, and workforce development are priorities that have risen to the top of our discussions in the last year. We are so fortunate to have a breadth and depth of expertise at our institution that has allowed for some deep dives into planning for technology, facilities, public safety and pedagogy in our next phase. And I've been working with leadership across the institution to explore the tools that we will need to advance these areas and researching the cost to implement them. Now this work is still ongoing, but I want to share a general vision for how the college will use these funds. First, we will address the risks that are specific to COVID-19 to prepare us for more face-to-face -face instruction and services. The pandemic has created some real pivots around higher education to hybrid teaching and learning and to technology tools that enhance the relationships that our faculty and staff have with students. We know that these have profound impacts on student success, so those will continue. But we'll need to expand access to ensure radical inclusion, that we're meeting students in places where they can really achieve given the new challenges that they face. Our first priority always, health and safety. 
Radically inclusive approaches to health on our campuses will mean deploying funds to prepare our buildings and spaces for more face-to-face -face interactions. And although we've managed remotely over the past year, parts of our workforce will be returning when conditions are safe, as remote instruction and services are not ideal for many of our students. Only some jobs in our institution can truly be delivered solely in a remote status. So we'll be having more conversations about that in the coming months. But in the meantime, the work to make our facilities safer is already in progress. We know more about how the coronavirus spreads than we did last year. And we're already implementing that knowledge with assessments of air filtration and HVAC systems. Some substantive in investments will likely be made to ensure the health and safety of our employees and our students. Some measures we're already familiar with, such as masks and plexiglass shields, signage, and more frequent disinfecting. But there will also likely be work on air filtration, which science says will lower the risk of the virus being transmitted. Now, you all know I'm not a building engineer, but we've gathered a lot of advice from our facilities experts and scientists and planning for these changes. And as you might imagine, some of these will be time consuming and may mean that some buildings won't be ready for occupancy as soon as others. But our facilities team, they are phenomenal. And they've been working long hours for months to evaluate our current needs and plan for the work that may be needed. And I'm very grateful for their expertise and planning. Now we expect to be able to use some federal recovery dollars for these projects as they are an immediate response to COVID. Equipping our classrooms with audio and cameras so that instructors can teach both remote and in-person students is another significant investment. This will protect future classes from disruption by weather or illness or some other catastrophe similar to a pandemic. This is future-proofing, and this is an element of planning that we're already building into our new designs. One important lesson of this year has been agility. In our next chapter, we're going to set ourselves up for success by building flexibility into our systems from the very beginning. We're not the only ones doing this. I think you'll see that this is going to be an ongoing part of the next normal in higher education in K-12 and certainly in many businesses. Being able to respond in ways that protect education from interruption will be the standard. Now this may also include investments in proctoring software, licensing, and certainly employee training. And we're looking carefully at what is approved for spending in the funding within the guidelines that we've been given thus far. Now another lesson that the pandemic has highlighted has been about access. Technology has taken an outsized role in remote operations during COVID. Students who are trying to apply, register, and enroll, they face new barriers. They can't be resolved oftentimes face-to-face -face as we're living right now, and as they may have been done in the past. Making these processes smooth and consistent is a part of access in the virtual world. It requires technology tools that can provide part of what an in-person assistant once could have done. And as the college takes steps to keep students connected to classrooms, we must ensure that they are connected to the administrative processes that were able to formally be done face-to-face. -face. Whether it's more hardware for our students, targeted software, improved broadband access, or stronger signals, we will strengthen the access points that make virtual learning a reality for everyone. Now, this is now a feature of access that is going to be a standard moving forward and a part of our vision of radical inclusion. As I said, technology matters because relationships matter. That's where students get their greatest value. Every interaction that we have with a student can inspire that feeling of belonging that translates ultimately and hopefully to success. We know how much this matters because students tell us. In our SENSE survey, an overwhelming majority of our students this past year 
felt that faculty wanted them to succeed. I want y'all to sit with that. Students felt that. That is an accomplishment that should be celebrated. That students perceived faculty's investments in them during remote instruction is a testament to the heroic work that was done this year. This was also captured in instructor evaluations this year. We also know from marketing studies that having a welcoming environment is one of the most highly rated student priorities. So continuing to cultivate the sense of belonging in a virtual environment matters just as much as ever, perhaps even more than before. These relationships are also what enable students to reach out for help. Let me give you an example. During this last year, we learned a lot about students' needs, and, and that happened through our people. Technology didn't tell us the students were food insecure or didn't have Wi-Fi at home. Our faculty and staff did that. That enabled us to turn to the Montgomery College Foundation for support. It also helped use the $6.5 million in her student emergency assistance distributed by the Office of Financial Aid. And another $5.5 million in additional funds are available now for student assistance. And we're processing those applications with an emphasis on need. The American Rescue Plan will have additional funds for emergency student assistance in the future. The point is that stories from human interactions helped us see new vulnerabilities and then address them. That's the heart of what community colleges were designed to do. That is distinct from other institutions of higher education. And that is what is driving our plans for the future. Now, a related priority at the college will be investing in our social safety net for student needs. The Student Health and Wellness Center, better known as Shaw Center, has grown over the past few years in its capacities and in its partnerships and is now well positioned to have a greater impact than ever than previous years. The mental health impacts of COVID are evident everywhere. And this may be an area in which we can invest some future funds. The rules of our grant usage are specific, so we're evaluating those requirements as they become available. But it seems clear that the work of radical inclusion will have to provide some support to students in the coming years to truly have the desired impact. Mental health, food security, access to technology and childcare. So we will continue to look for ways to supplement the valuable ongoing work of the Montgomery College Foundation and the Shaw Center. Now another place where we can deepen our impact is on the student experience. If radical inclusion is about more than just access to education, then we must help students get to success. We must continue our work at eliminating barriers that exist in processes such as registration and enrollment and transfer. In some ways, COVID has helped us see very clearly where we have bottlenecks in our system that could be improved with technology. So we're planning for some investments in those areas as well. And some of this is already a part of our IT planning, but we will be focusing and refocusing again in the very near future. Naming and removing barriers while also flattening decision making to the level of opportunity will be a key goal of the college over the next several months. And in some ways, there have been some really good lessons from COVID. We've adapted because conditions required it. Assessment and placement were slowed considerably in the remote status. So we implemented some creative solutions and the results have been promising. We will be consulting with the Student Success Network for guidance about how to best meet some other challenges we encounter. And I suspect there will be a combination of technology solutions, process evaluations, and a continued commitment to engagement with students. And as we bring better tools to the table, faculty and staff training will be a place for significant investment. How we prepare folks to serve students changing needs is our responsibility as an institution, and we're owning that. 
As our work on career pathways accelerates, mastery of technology will undoubtedly be embedded in these processes moving forward. These changes are not just in education, they are across many industries. And I predict that 10 years from now, human resource folks, they're gonna be talking about the skills and knowledge in terms of pre-COVID and post-COVID. That's how dramatic these changes are going to be. Now on a related note, students who need training and credentialing through WDCNE have been hit especially hard by the shift to remote instruction. Many of them rely on in-person registration and some of their courses don't translate well to remote learning. We now have a technology system which addresses those challenges and we plan to implement it as soon as possible. And part of future-proofing the college is ensuring that the division that helps residents get the training needed to join the workforce swiftly is not vulnerable to disruption. As the vaccine hopefully stabilizes our business sector and hiring picks up again, we may need to change and manage more outreach from industries and from workers seeking to get back into the workforce. Now, because of our linkages to government and business are so crucial in this space, I plan to establish a single workforce point of contact for WDCE. There is already so much essential productive activity in this space that we want to ensure that people outside the college and inside the college can be quickly and efficiently connected with the right pathways there. As activity accelerates, a single unifying voice in this space will add value to our service model. We already have partnerships with Amazon and Apple, as well as of a lot of activity in the biotechnology sector. With the new barriers that the pandemic has created for WDCE, we need to have a single point of contact so that collaborations can continue effectively and efficiently on a much larger scale. Clearly, the pandemic has forced us to think more deeply about how we serve, but also whom we serve. Now, you may have heard that just before the pandemic struck, the county asked the college to conduct a feasibility study around a college presence in the East County. A review of community needs, available real estate, and budgeting produced some very positive feedback. Now, there's definitely interest in a presence there, which we're very excited about, which might precede a larger project, such as a full campus. That will probably be about seven to 10 years out. But the pandemic pressures to upskill displaced workers may accelerate these plans in the near term. We are considering now what it would take to set up some classrooms, offices, and meeting rooms in the East County to serve residents where they are. The site could potentially offer short-term training opportunities, student services, and perhaps a community engagement center. The college will be presenting this to the Board of Trustees at its April meeting, so we will follow up with their evaluation of this proposal. The board's commitment, though, to access and inclusion, it is deep. It's unparalleled, in my opinion. So I suspect it will be uh, a resonant moment with them in terms of their values. Please watch for more in this space. As we think about whom we serve and how we do it, we also have to assess the larger higher education market. I mentioned earlier how COVID has repositioned the college within this space. Some of our strengths, diversity and the welcoming climate on campuses are limited in the remote setting. In some ways, we're now competing with fully online institutions which can operate from anywhere in the country. And while we plan to return to many face-to-face -face learning experiences, there is now a market for exclusively online instruction and student services, which we will also have to fill. That sector won't go away just because we began offering in-person learning again. Students who are also consumers now realize they have choices, which means that the college will have to provide options. Now, part of that answer would be formalizing our virtual campus, which supports the distance learning programs. These are continuing to grow and COVID has made some of them more attractive to students. 
So we'll be searching for a new dean and looking actively for additional partnerships. Now another part of competitiveness will be enhanced attention to relationships. When people drive processes instead of the other way around, the student experience improves. This may mean a new paradigm around service. Positioning people with the right skills to make meaningful, real-time decisions about processes is an idea getting more attention. We've seen a lot of this creative leadership in our remote existence, which may lay the groundwork for a model of student interactions, which is more about getting to outcomes. Technology will continue to be a part of the solution. It already has been during the pandemic with chatbots and live chats guiding students on their timetables. But the real catalyst is a combination, I believe, of human experience and artificial intelligence working together. The guidance that students need around complex financial aid scenarios or international transfer requirements often will require human experience to resolve. But to truly compete, we will need to be more efficient and interact more fluidly with technology. We have upped our game in this space during COVID considerably. We're already engaged in finding the right technology tools for our processes and implementing them. But growing our employees' potential through training is an additional area of investment to come. This will include onboarding, professional development, and career pathways. The college will future-proof our workforce with equipment, technology, infrastructure, and training that allow for seamless pivots to remote student services and instruction. And this has two benefits. It will ensure that employees can work to the top of their digital capacities and that they can design solutions for student challenges in real time. Now, all of this planning around student experience is ultimately about putting students on paths to success, preparing them for in-demand jobs and enhancing their economic mobility are values that we share with our local partners. Getting students into the workforce for the first time or into new employment areas is where the rubber meets the road. The jobs picture is improving already, and we want to continue to fuel its local rebound. Our partnerships with the county and local stakeholders is a big part of this. And as the county continues to rebound, the value that Montgomery College brings to the recovery is understood and appreciated. And even more from us is expected. So we will continue to take both leadership and followership roles in actively shaping an economic future for Montgomery County and the state of Maryland that ensures that no one is left behind, that we ensure that we have the ability to provide relevant and economically mobile pathways. Now, I recently uh, had the opportunity to talk with a legislator in another state about the value of community colleges in general and the larger COVID-related efforts about recovery. <clears throat> and I said, every city and town in the nation needs three things right now. Vaccines, jobs for the vulnerable, and skilled labor to grow local businesses. Community colleges are the only place where you will find all three of these. Now, I'm sure most of you know that earlier this month, a mass vaccination center was set up on our Germantown campus. But Maryland is not the only state with a COVID vaccination center at a community college. Arizona, Massachusetts, North Carolina, New York, Pennsylvania, and Washington State also have them. Why? Because they, we, are local, familiar, and we're trusted by people in need and by responsible stakeholders. This is no accident. In times of urgency, when outcomes matter more than ever, community colleges are anchors to which people turn. Our skills are respected and our ethos is trusted. In fact, that's what the Truman Commission wanted in 1947 when it established a system of community colleges in the United States. It was another time of national crisis 
World War II was ending and hundreds of thousands of men were returning from the fight in Europe. Some were injured, some were low skilled. Many of their jobs had been filled while they were away and the GI Bill was a new opportunity for economic mobility. The country took a national crisis and built something better. It expanded the middle class and home ownership. It enacted a large scale infrastructure program, much like the one that is being proposed right now. It was an era of great uncertainty, but community colleges dove in with resolution. In fact, our nation turned to these colleges because it needed a combination of values and local connections. It could see that expertise and scholarship directed to regional needs and local people would have a unique impact. It understood that building equity would open opportunity and create growth. This past year has been extraordinary in several ways. As individuals, we face challenges, develop new skills, and evolve through this crisis. It has not been easy, and I know this, but it has shown us the grit and ingenuity that we all possess. And as an institution, we found ourselves with new insights and a new vision for what is possible and have taken charge of driving change in the midst of insecurity. Our nation is once again turning to its community colleges to lead. We are being given a remarkable opportunity that has grown out of crisis to increase the impact of our work on our students and our community. We are planning strategically so that our investments are catalysts for growth, to deepen our mission of radical inclusion, to expand the reach of our services and to produce outcomes that are equitable and empowering. Now, I look to each of you, wherever you sit in this organization, to bring your energy, your creativity to these transformative efforts. This year has shown the depth of our commitment to our students and our great capacities, even under considerable stress. Out of circumstances we never could have imagined, we have the potential to create more opportunity. If we do it with intention and collaboration, we may create change that is meaningful and lasting. And if we do it with heart and compassion, we will most certainly create a legacy that is worthy of our genesis. Thank you for choosing to be here today. Be well.